Welcome to part 23 of why you shouldn't use RSA scoreboard version. Okay, um, let's start with something which is a bit more of an interesting property than a real vulnerability, but it will turn out to be a vulnerability in most settings. Namely, there's a property called homomorphic encryption. So the system is homomorphic if you have some operation on the ciphertext space and some operation on the, uh, on the message space so that these are compatible with the encryption. You should have seen homomorphic as a notion in algebra, in group theory, where it means you take, can take a function that is homomorphic and take it from one group to the other, such that it doesn't matter whether you first do the group operation and then send one argument through, or do send both arguments through, and then do the group operation on the other side. And the same happens here with the same word homomorphic, where the operation is called the encryption, and you're sending things, messages from the message space to the ciphertext space. And let's assume we have on the ciphertext space some operation which are just called serve, so it could be an addition or it could be a multiplication, something that could be useful to you. And then on the message space, there's another operation, again, could be multiplication or could be more involved because, well, as we've seen, sometimes matches it. Uh, ciphertext are more complicated. Think of the, the symmetric world where you're adding a Mac or something like that. Okay, so if you have a system so that if you're doing either serve on the message uh, on the ciphertext side or triangle on the message side and getting the same like, uh, relation, we're speaking of a homomorphic encryption system. And now, well, the caption only gives it away, RSA is a homomorphic encryption system. So let's look at what we have for the RSA encryption. So for RSA, there's a public key, which is n, e. Everybody knows this. And if you're seeing two ciphertexts, C1 and C2, then you know that these are just the m1 to the e and m2 to the e, everything taken modulo n. And then you learn that if you're taking the product of two e powers, well, you can also take the product first and then move the eth power on the other side. And so we have a very easy homomorphism here, which is just the same on the message side as well as on the ciphertext side, namely multiplication modulo n. So we're taking our ciphertext, we multiply them, and that implicitly multiplies the plain text. And it's an interesting feature. So you don't need to be the person who knows what the plain texts are in order to do this operation. So this could be useful in some settings where you want to operate on encrypted data. Now, the multiplication is often less useful than the addition, but even this could be interesting. But it's also a tool for the attacker. So it's not always a bad thing, but if you're having a homomorphic property and it's not, not what you need for your system, you should get rid of it. So you should, most importantly, be aware that you have it. Now, with signatures, we got rid of the homomorphic property because we use the hash function on the message. So if you look at the, at the signatures, just as taking m to the d, and I'll have a slide on that in a moment, then you would also have the homomorphic property. But for signatures, you always need this hash function for functionality, because you want to be able to sign arbitrary long messages. For encryption, we typically just want to send a symmetric key over, and so we don't care about the length, but for signatures, we need to deal with messages that are like videos or pictures or well, maybe just the text message of 160 characters. But all of those have to fit into the same number, uh, well, same range of numbers between 0 and n minus 1. And so for hash function, uh, for RSA signatures, are already motivated that one, we want to use the hash function. And in this case, it also helps to avoid this homomorphic property. Now, why is it a problem? So let's look again at the security requirements. And at this point, you should have watched already um, the security notions for public key um, video. So in that one, I explain different attacker goals and different attacker abilities. On these slides, I assume you have seen those, and I'll just highlight the ones that we're attacking in this particular case. So here, we're going to look at the one-wayness, so the impossibility of recovering the message from the ciphertext with the ability that the attacker can query for decryptions. And in particular, we like the CCA2 version of it, where we can just query at any moment, so we're getting any challenges, and we want to be able to still ask for ciphertext. But of course, we're not allowed to ask 
the challenge ciphertext. So we're getting some challenge C, and then we can still continue to ask for decryptions on anything but this message C. Now, this combination, one wayness and CCA security, is impossible to achieve if you have a homomorphic system. So homomorphic systems cannot be one way CCA2 secure. Because if you give the attacker the ability to ask for decryptions of anything, anything except for this one ciphertext, then let's see how they could turn this one ciphertext, this C, into a differently looking ciphertext, ask for the encryption, ask for the decryption of that, and then um, learn the decryption of the original ciphertext from it. So here's how. We pick some random message R and its public key system so we can compute the encryption of R. Let's call this thing CR. And then we use the homomorphic property that we can combine this challenge C that we're actually interested in with our CR that we just computed. And that's some C prime, which looks different from C. So if we feed this to, the, we call these things an oracle. So if we are asking for, hey, could you please be so kind and decrypt this C prime for me, look, looks nothing like the C that you say that you can't decrypt for me, then you will get a decryption of it. But what's actually in the C prime? So this was the encryption of M combined with the encryption of R. And I realized I flipped the order of those, sorry for that. So it should be encryption of M followed by the encryption of R combined with C. And that is actually the combination of, well, it's a homomorphic system. So there's some operation which is taking R and M together. Okay, so then we asked for the decryption of this thing, which gives us R triangle M, and then we somehow recover M from our triangle. Now, if you're thinking of the RSA case, then this triangle is just multiplication mod N, so we're just dividing by R module N. In other systems, maybe it's addition, maybe it's something more complicated, but typically this operation is something like a group operation where you have an input. So, yes, I'm assuming here that this triangle can be inverted, so I can somehow get M from knowing R and R triangle M, but there is a huge flexibility in what the attacker can choose. So for instance, in the case of RSA, I couldn't invert P. P is one of the factors of N. So if I choose R to be P, then um, I couldn't compute M from it. But if I would know P, then I'm the attacker. This is not my public key. So if I would know P, I could actually factor this key and I would actually have managed to recover the secret key from the public key, which is an even stronger um, attack than just breaking, well, just, I mean, breaking one way is pretty bad as well. So I assume that I won't accidentally find R equals P, and so all the R's I pick will be in word for P. And so in all of these games in the CCA2 security, there's no restriction on what you can ask for decryption on, other than, well, it must not be the challenge. So any C prime works um, as long as it doesn't give you C. Now I had already announced that um, this hash function is pretty important in the signature scheme. So let's take a look at what would happen if the signature was simply taking the message and computing the deep power of it. And again, as a, as a reminder, here are the attacker goals in the signature case. And Again, I'm selecting those which we're going to break. So in this case, there are two. Um, and there are two different notions of portability. So can you compute signatures on messages of your choice? That is universal portability. Or can you just create some portability? So produce a signature on a message that hasn't been signed before. That is still pretty bad, but it's not as strong as the other one. So that is existential portability. Well, you're breaking the existential unforgeability. In the former case, you're breaking universal unforgeability. And similar to the game in the encryption setting, we also have some abilities for the attacker. So the attacker might just have signature uh, message signature pairs, or might have the ability to actually request signatures on messages of his choice. So let's start with a warm-up exercise. Let's assume we're just giving one single signature. So 
you observe my server has a certificate and it's signed by my key. And just from seeing one signature in this situation where the signature is just M to the D, you could actually create some forged signature under my key. So can we take this M1 and the signature on M1 and produce some other M2 with a valid signature? And you should think about homomorphic properties because, well, that's the last thing we've just seen. So can we turn the homomorphic properties of RSA, which we now have gotten back because I changed how the signature system works, can we use that to produce some other message? Well, homomorphic properties normally need two messages. In this case, I'm only given one. So the best I can do is take this thing and square it. So how about let's take M2 being the square of M1 mod N. Now the signature, that is just M1 to the D. And what I want is M1 to the 2D, which I can just get from the public information by also squaring the signature. So by just having this, this homomorphic property here, I'm getting another valid signature M2S2 by taking both components and squaring them independently or separately mod N, and that gives me a valid signature on M2. M2 might not be very useful. There might be other ways to detect that this is a forgery, but by the definitions I've just broken, or we've just broken, the extension on forgeability under, under no message attacks. So this is not as powerful an attack model as a CMA attack, so we don't get to query, but we're also just breaking extension forgeability. So let's see whether we can also do something in the stronger setting. So let's see whether we can break Universal unforgeability. Yeah, okay, let's grant ourselves some power to query for signatures. So now we want to break UUCMA. So we want to construct a signature on something we actually need, like I will get a 10 on this course. Signed, Tanya. So we create this message with all the right padding, whatever it needs, and then we compute some other message. And in the CMA game, you're allowed to query any message other than the message that is where you're going to uh, output a forgery. So anything M prime is, is fair game, it need not be useful. So I will not judge you for sending me some random garbage. I will just sign and you won't get a 10. Well, maybe you'll get a 10. Let's hope you'll get a 10. So what you do is you take the message and you multiply by 2 to the E. So E is the public exponent, so you know that one. And 2, well, it's just a small number that you know is invertible mod, two, mod n. And then you ask me to sign n prime. And, well, I'm a CMA uh, partner, so I'll sign anything. Here's your signature. All right, what is actually the signature on m prime? Now, m prime is this m times 2 to the e. And the signature is just taking this thing to the power of d, and then the whole thing mod, mod n. Okay, so let's look at this thing. So we have our m prime there, and then for the second part, the signature, which is actually the interesting part, let's unravel this. So if I compute the dth power, and that's what you get from me as a signature, so then you're having m to the d. Now, that will be the valid signature on m that you want. And what happened to the 2 there? So there was a 2 to the e that you had put in, and then I raised it to the d. And you know from how RSA works that something to the e times d is just the something. So the signature on m prime, that is just two times the signature on m. Well, that one you can undo. So now you can present m, well, the message you actually want to sign, and you take the signature you got from me, divide by 2 mod n, and you have a valid signature on m. So you really want to have the hash function there, or I really want to have the hash function there. As the security engineer, as the cryptographer, you want the H of M there. As a, crypt, as a crypt analyst, you're very happy not to have the H there. Much more flexibility. Let's go back to encryption. We haven't actually looked at all the notions yet. So there was also this uh, indistinguishability where I explained that it's equivalent to semantic security, but easier to deal with. So this is a game where the attacker chooses two messages, then gives them to a challenger, 
gets back the encryption of one of them, so that the challenger does some coin flip, some fix some red and B, and sends me the encryption of M sub B. Now, the game is to correctly predict which of the two was encrypted. And just to be clear, this is normally a useful game. This is not a useful game for Scoobot RSA because we shouldn't use Scoobot RSA. Well, I guess you got this message. We're now in iteration 27, counting three more, four more from the beginning. Um, why does this one go wrong? No, this is not the whole model property. This is something else. Do notice that you know what the messages are and you know exactly how encryption works. You just can take m1 and m0 and compute the eth power of those, and you can find out which of those in the ciphertext. Schoolbook RSA is just deterministic. There is no randomness in there. So the distinguishability and the shows on plain text attacks doesn't make any sense for a deterministic encryption function. You can just encrypt at home, see what comes out, compare with a challenge, and therefore get a 100% chance of saying correctly what the belief was. And if it's not in CPA secure, then it's also not CCA secure. So the CCA, um, if you have CPA broken, then you also have CCA broken. Okay, so after all this, you do want to have some padding, you don't want to have short messages, you want to have some randomized padding because, well, there was already the attacks which would have been stopped by randomization, like the ones with the Chinese domain theorem. But also here's another argument why you really need to have a probabilistic, so a randomized encryption function. And then, well, let's look, because this is the course on disasters in cryptography. So let's look at one of the eh, quite disastrous uh, in cryptography, namely RSA PPCS number one. There's a one missing twice now, uh, version 1.5. So this one is unfortunately still sometimes to be found on the internet, hopefully uh, on the way out. And it's a way of how you can randomize and pad your message. So the message M is this last little piece there in the padded message. And let's look what's on the left of it. So you're taking your message, then on the left of it, you put in two zeros. Now put up there that zero here actually means four zeros. So that is a hexadecimal notation. So it's when you're getting from zero till e all the uh, till f all the numbers where f is 15, 0 is 0. So that means if you write it in bits, it's actually four bits. So seeing 0, 0, 0, 0 there, that means eight bits are zero. And then at the beginning of the padding string, there you have 0, 0, 0, 2. So that means 12 zeros as bits, followed by the string, well, 2 is no. No eight, no four, one, two, and a zero. So it's zero, zero, one, zero. And then everything in the middle, so that this whole thing has the same length as the modulus n, that one is some random string r. Now they have learned the lesson and they did want to have some randomness there. So the requirement in the standard is that you have at least eight bytes of randomness. And the randomness, otherwise, the length of it is chosen so that the Padded message has the same length as the modulus. So if all you want to do is send a 256 session bit session key and you have a 2048 RSA or 4000 bit RSA, then a large chunk of this is actually padding, is in this in this randomness. Now the other side has to check whether the message is valid. So at this point, we haven't avoided any of the uh, homomorphic properties yet. But the next step is actually meant to avoid the homomorphic properties. So this is dealing with the deterministic part. So this would be one-way CPA secure, but it would still have the issues with the distinguishability or the one-wayness. So this would be in CPA secure, but it would still have problems with the one-wayness because we would have the homomorphic properties. But we're now insisting on the start. So the start has to be these um, 0, 0, 0, 0002, so these fixed 16 bits at the beginning, and else we're outputting decryption failure. And then to figure out where the message is, 
we're scanning till we find a zero zero and then we just say okay everything in between is the randomness we can ignore that and then the rest is the message if you if the decoder doesn't find any double zero then there's a failure so there are possibilities so somebody is trying to tag you and sending you these invalid cyber texts which are using the home of property so in those cases pkcs version one, one um, pkcs one version 1.5 designers were hoping that having these fixed bits there would stop these attacks so there are two possibilities of how you get failure and else well it gets the message and does something about it now bleichenbacher in the late 90s already noticed that you can actually get quite some information out of the information whether this failed or not. So let's let's look at this in more detail. So if C is the encryption of the padded message, so we know E and well we know how the padding works, we know what the length of the message is, and we know that normally RSA is homomorphic. So let's just use this homomorphic property again the same way that we did this in the in the signature attack. So we're sending for some random s, we're computing s to the e times c. And then we'll hear back either decryption failure, so there was no start of 0, 0, 0, 0002, some small chance that there is no 0, 0, um, but I mean 16 bits versus 8 bits, so this is the, the stronger indication it probably was the beginning, but let's assume that this passed through. So that means that the a start match and that somewhere there's a all zero, uh, zero zero. So if there's no decoding failure, then oops, it's uh, it's missing the other two digits. So it should be zero 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 two there. And that means that if we look at the plain text, so the the encrypted message, which is having ciphertext as to the e times c, that actually has plain text s times n. But now this is not m itself, this is s times m, which could be a bit larger than n. Well, depending on how large the s was, if we just shows s to be 2, then it is at most twice as large as n. If we show s to be 3, then it's at most three times as large. So we know that there is this k, and we have a good information how large this k is at most. Um, so we can maybe search for two values, but typically it's just one. Um, then we know that this difference, so what we get after computing s times n, moving it mod n, is in, in the range where the starting bits or the starting bytes are 0, 0, 0, 2. So that means while well, the first 16 bits are known. And it's in this interval. And then what Leichenbach's attack is doing is just trying a whole bunch of these s. And then for each of those that succeed, you learn another relation. And these relations are enough to actually recover n. We don't go into the details here, but it's a it's a very interesting thing to see how something which is meant as e adding security against the homomorphic attack and then can be broken by using features of the homomorphic attack, namely this s to the e times c is exactly what you would be using in the homomorphic in the homomorphic attack. And then, well, the padding is just way too short. So it's way too easy to get valid messages, but if the padding, if the part at the beginning would be longer, you would learn a lot more. So there is no easy way out of this one. So PKCS version 1, uh, 1 version 1.5 really has a lot of problems. So what the lessons are learned and now really stop banging on, well, don't use Google RSA. Of course, don't use Google RSA. So when you use RSA, you do require to have a randomized padding, else this really goes bad. If you uh, look at PC, PCS, PKCS number one version 1.5, then that's really a negative example. And we still, at least two years ago, we still see attacks um, on how this gets broken in practice. So there's still some servers, or there's still some servers out there which supported this version and therefore could be used as a decryption oracle. There are better schemes, so RSA OAP, so that's uh, optimized asymmetric encryption padding is a better padding scheme. So if you actually want something constructive, take a look at that one. And then the last message is it's really important that the signatures have the hash function.
not just for functionality, but also for security.